Good morning, happy campers. How's everybody doing, huh? 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 Yes, sir. We're going to have some high flying fun today at the Pensacola Naval Aviation Museum. But first, why don't we check in with our old prophetic pal, Tommy the Swami? Hmm? Greetings, curious one. The Naval Aviation Museum is truly amazing, no? All of those enormous flying machines. The pilots that flew them must have been very, very brave. But I'll bet that they might have been a little bit frightened at first. But once they learned all about the planes they were flying, and once they learned how to fly, they probably weren't as afraid as they were before. As usual, you're probably saying, Tommy the Swami, get to the point for goodness sake. Okay, okay, I get to the point. You see, it's okay to be afraid of something, but, and it's a big but, if you learn about what you are afraid of, chances are you might not be as afraid of it as you were before. Then you will be as brave as all of those hotshot Navy pilots. And speaking of pilots, it's time for me to fly. So until next time, Sim Saladim. And may the road to enlightenment be free of speed bumps. Well, Walla Bear, old buddy, old pal, I understand that you and happy campers Thomas and Matthew went to uh, the Naval Aviation Museum over in Pensacola. Is that right? Hmm? Well, why don't we check and see what you got with the camper cam? Hmm? Good morning, boys and girls. Welcome to the National Museum of Naval Aviation in Pensacola, Florida. Come on upstairs, we'll give you a tour. Oh, I'm glad you got here. I'm sure you recognize these airplanes behind Tracy and I. That's the Blue Angels, a demonstration team for the U.S. Navy that flies around the country summer and winter. The National Museum of Naval Aviation is located aboard NAS Pensacola, Florida because this is the birthplace of naval aviation. Some 80 years ago, the Navy, Coast Guard, Marine Corps started training their pilots right here in Pensacola. They've been doing it ever since. It's a wonderful place to visit. Come out and see us anytime, and it's free. Now I'm going to turn it over to Tracy. She's going to take you on a little tour downstairs. All right, boys and girls, let's go on downstairs. We'll meet Walla Bear, Thomas, and Matthew, and go on a little tour. tell you what, while they keep playing on the go mount, I'm going to show you the carrier deck. These are some of the aircraft that were flown in World War II, and this is called the island on a carrier deck. It's where the officers and the, uh, they man the ship and make sure that everything is running right. We have quite a few uh, aircraft, as you can see here. Now we're going to throw it over to George so you can see some of our jet fighters. Okay, boys and girls, this is the exciting part of the museum where you see the modern-day aircraft. We've got jets here. We've got more Navy jets down there and Marine Corps airplanes and helicopters. We've got the older aircraft that uh, go back 80 years, back when your grandfather was involved in thinking about flying in the old days. So please come out and see us at the National Museum of Naval Aviation. We're open seven days a week. We're free. And there's 130 plus airplanes for you to, to see, and some of them you can get in and climb around on. So I hope you'll take advantage of that and come see us here in Pensacola. And now we'll take a little break, and we'll come back later on with Ensign Marsher's son on, and we'll go to the flight adventure deck. Let's go back to the Naval Aviation Museum with our old pal, the Walla Bear and the Camper Cam. Hmm? Good morning, boys and girls. Today we're going to tell you about some of the gear that a pilot would be wearing in order to go flying. If you guys come over here, Matthew and Thomas are going to be our demonstrators. Matthew here is showing all our fashions that we're wearing. First thing we want to start off with is our flight suit. This flight suit can withstand about 800 degrees of temperature. That's a lot hotter than what your bath would be. So I could stand here and hold a match to this and it wouldn't burn. Unfortunately, my skin's going to melt before that. 
It's just to help me get out of my plane in case of a fire. The next thing that we'd like to put on is what's called a G-suit. This is this thing that Matthew has on right here, and it goes down onto his legs. There's five areas. One comes across his stomach here, one across his thigh, and one across the bottom. You're probably wondering why it's called a G-suit. Well, G stands for gravity. It's a force that keeps us right here on the ground. What happens is when a person goes into a jet that's flying really high and really fast, they're being forced back into that seat and into that jet. And when they pull a nice turn, all of a sudden you feel all these forces. If you've ever been in an airplane, you feel it taking off. It's a lot of force against you. All the blood goes from your head all the way down to your big toe. You don't want that to happen because you're going to pass out. So what these five bladders would do is push all that blood right back up here to your head so that you can think and you can keep going. The next thing that we put on is what's called a harness. When you hop into a car, the first thing that you put on is your seatbelt. Well, this is a pilot's seatbelt. If Matthew turns around here, you can see it's pretty complicated. It goes down the back, you turn around here, it's got a lot of zippers. We've got these things up here to hook us in. I'll show you what this is going to hook into. It's going to hold us into our parachute and our seat. If we go down into the water, we want somebody to come and rescue us. It would be a little bit difficult if we hung onto a bar or onto a rope, our arms would get tired. So we have this thing right here. It's called a D-ring. kind of looks like the letter D. Well, a cable would drop down from a helicopter, and they'd hook this on, and they'd just kind of pull us up so we won't have to worry about hanging on to anything. Some of the other equipment that we want to use, you turn around right here, guys, you can see what's called our life preserver unit and our survival vest. You have Matthew kind of slip this on here. This is where most of our survival gear is in. This would come around and zip up here in the front. One of the things you see right here is his survival knife. It's not very sharp. Actually, you can see I can run my hand on it. You don't want to do that with a regular knife. This isn't very sharp, and it's used to cut off branches and things. Some of the other gear that we have in there, we've arranged out here on the floor. We've got what's called a sea dye marker. If we go down in the water, we can dip this in, and it'll turn the water a bright orange or a bright green. It's not a normal color for the ocean, so it would show up pretty well. We've got a mirror to signal some of the planes. The light would catch in the mirror, and you'd see it shining in your eyes, and you'd know something was down there. We've got a safety blanket to keep us warm, and also at night it's to keep us uh, protected from the elements. We've got our little compass here, just so we know which direction we're going. We've also got a radio so we can talk to people and let them know where we are. One thing everybody asks is if we have any food. We don't have crackers because they spoil too easily. So we have these things, and they're called Enerjets. And what they are, they're sugar. It's like a big candy bar, almost like caramels. And this has a lot of caffeine and sugar in it to keep us wide awake for when people come to rescue us. We've also got a whistle so that people can hear us. If I'm out there screaming for about six hours, I won't have a voice anymore. So I have my whistle so I can just blow that and get their attention. I've got a funny looking flashlight and it's got a red lens. What happens is if you turn off the lights at night, you can't see anything. And about 15 minutes later, you can start to see shadows. That's called night vision. So when I turn on that light and turn it off again, you can't see. So this red lens here will help us to see a lot faster. It won't destroy that night vision. We've also got a flare here. This isn't actually one, but it looks just like it. We've got an orange side, which bright orange smoke would come out in the daytime. And at night, the side with the bumps on, we'd pop that open, and it would be like a big firecracker. And there's bumps on there, so we can find it at night. Well, that's some of the equipment that we use. And right now, we're going to put Matthew in what's called an ejection seat. This is how we get away from our aircraft. If somebody's shooting at us or a wing happens to go wrong, this is how we get out. We're going to have to walk over this way. There we go. Matthew, do you want to be a helicopter or a jet pilot?
He wants to be a jet pilot. So I'll let him put on this helmet. This is a helicopter pilot's helmet. It has these really big ear pads in it so that you can hear the people on the ground. And also, your engine is right up above you on a helicopter. So it's really loud and really noisy. So this way you can hear the people that are in the back and on the ground. Now if you want to be a jet pilot, well, some of the things we have on here is the oxygen mask so he can breathe. This hooks into his plane. There's also a microphone inside so he can talk with everyone. He's also got his sun visor right here. We're going to pull that down. He kind of looks like an alien. But this is to protect him from the sun, and it's also to protect him from anything that's floating around in the cockpit, any dust or dirt. Sometimes we go upside down and things start falling up. And so that would get into our eyes, and that's to protect us. Well, Matthew, we're going to have you crawl into our ejection seat here. We're going to send Matthew up through the roof. All that gear is pretty heavy, isn't it? All that gear that we would be wearing is about 40 pounds. So he's moving almost 40 pounds up in there. These straps right here are called the parachute risers. These are what hold him onto his parachute, which is already located in his seat. We're going to hook him in right here. Remember, that's his seat belt, so he's already hooked in. In case something would happen and you have to pull these handles, those are going to send him out. Well, what happens is, Matthew, I'm going to have you reach up here and grab these handles. All right. And underneath the chair, there's a bunch of rocket explosives. As soon as he pulls those handles, they're going to send him right out. The top's going to come off. He's going to float away to safety. What we say is eject, eject, eject three times. We don't want the person behind us to think that we said something wrong. We want them to know what we mean. So when I say eject, 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 Matthew, you're going to pull those down and in front of your face, all right? OK? Eject, eject, eject. All right. At this point, Matthew will already be out of the plane. All right, thank you very much, Matthew. Well, happy campers, there's a lot more where that came from. But first, why don't we check in with our benevolent benefactor, J. Walter Waldbanger. Well, hey there. How about that Naval Aviation Museum? Now, that's big. But even though the history of the United States Navy and its airplanes is a big story, none of it would have been possible without two simple ideas, planning and work. Now, do you think the folks that were in charge of the Navy just woke up one day and said, hey, let's use airplanes? Heck no. First, they needed a plan. They had to figure out how they were going to use them and who was going to fly them. Now, once they figured that out, the next step was to create a place where Navy folks could learn how to fly. This was their plan. And once they had their plan, they had to work to accomplish their plan. So thanks to that, naval aviation became a reality. But before it could happen, they had to have a plan. And then they had to work. So where do you fit in? Simple. If there's something you want to accomplish, You've got to have a plan, and you've got to work. And speaking of work, i got to get back to business. So take it from old J. Walter Wallbanger. Keep plugging, and always remember that you're never too small to think big. Guess what, happy campers? The news is next. This is a Camp Walla Bear special edition of Action News 10. Good morning, happy campers. I'm Eleanor Reynolds, and this is Walla Bear News. Do you guys remember Gucci the dog and the senseless acts of violence that left the puppy scarred for life? Well, this week, nearly three months after the attack, Gucci underwent reconstructive surgery at Auburn University's veterinary school. A team of three surgeons and veterinary students repaired Gucci's burned face and his eyelids. Doctors expect him to recover within eight weeks. How many of you have gardens in your backyard? Do you ever pick the fresh produce for your folks? 
think you'd pick it if you had to climb down a 25-foot ladder to get to it? Well, that's what this lady in Chattanooga, Tennessee does every day to get to her garden. It was the only spot of land on her property where she could plant some vegetables. So down went the 25-foot ladder to this plot of land where she grows tomatoes, okra, corn, and squash. That's quite a climb for healthy vegetables, isn't it? <laughs> there was a time not that long ago when everything shown in film or on television was in black and white. But today, in an attempt to get young people like you to watch great old films like this one, The Little Rascals, technicians are using computers to color in the films. What marketers have found is that children are attracted to colors better than anything in black and white. The hope is that by coloring in old classics like The Little Rascals, they will get and keep your attention longer so you, too, can enjoy these wonderful classics of old. And that's Walla Beer News for today. I'm Melinda Reynolds. Thanks for joining us, and remember, have fun this summer. Stay safe, obey your parents, and be kind to your brothers and sisters. Bye-bye. Now we're going to turn it over to Ensign Charlie Sides, and he's going to tell you about our upper deck. Hi, welcome to the upper deck. We're going to take a look at now some flight simulators as you see down the line here. We're on the line right now. As you look down the line, you'll see various helicopters and jets that are flown as simulators. What we can do up here is we walk up to the first one here and take a look. First one we have is a helicopter here. It's an AH-1 Sea Cobra. It's an attack helicopter. If you look in the cockpit here, you can see what a pilot will actually look at when he's flying the plane. There's this throttle here over here. It controls his steering. He has a throttle here for his engine speed. As you look in, you see a lot of different buttons and gadgets and lets the pilot know how fast he's going, how high in the air he is, and different things so he can fly the aircraft properly. And this is the pilot seat. And as we look into the back, you can see Matthew here is in the back. He's on his joystick in the back. As he's pretending he's flying around the upper deck of the museum here. So we'll take a walk around. We'll walk around and we'll take a look at Matthew and see what he's looking at in the back here. As you come around here, you can get a better look at some of the aircraft and simulators we have here. And here's Matthew here. As Matthew's step up here and take a look at Matthew. As you can see, Matthew here is on his throttle here, his joystick, and Matthew right now, he's sitting behind the pilot. This would be a co-pilot position or a backseat guy. So Matthew in the backseat here would be actually helping the pilot in the front of the helicopter fly this Sea Cobra, this attack helicopter. As we come back down, we'll walk on down the flight line here, we'll take a look. The next one here is the T-28 Trojan, and it's colored orange and black as you can see here, meaning that's a training helicopter. This is what the pilots train on, learn how to fly. As we walk around, these are the pilots learn to fly these bigger jets. The first one we have here is the A-7. It's an attack helicopter, a one-seat here, just a one-seat plane. As we walk over farther, the next one we'll see that Thomas is in. Thomas is the pilot of this one here. And this is our F-4 Phantom, and as you can see, it's a two-seat one. Put your pilot in the front, and in the back we'd have a Rio, or radar intercept officer. As we come around here, we take a look. Thomas is inside here, getting used to some of the controls. You see his hand here is on the throttle here, he's getting ready to fly. And he has all the same kind of gadgets that Thomas had on his aircraft. As you look down there, there's different flight control here. There's a throttle here that lets you increase your speed of your aircraft. And these different buttons here are used to shoot guns and missiles. As Thomas gets ready to go around and take a flight around. As we continue on down here, you can even see a wild bear is over here and he's in his He's in his A-7 Corsair too, his single aircraft, getting ready to go for a little flight in the upper deck here at the museum. What we're now going to do is we're going to walk over and take a look at the space part of our museum and show you a couple things over there. We're going to go up to the moon and we'll show you a little picture from the moon. We'll follow over here and we'll take a look at the space exhibit over here. Okay, as we walk over here, we're going to walk over here and take a look at the space museum. Take a look at the space exhibit part of our museum here on the upper deck as we continue on on our tour. As you can see, as we walk over here slowly, we see a space capsule. The camera's on now. This is actually one that went to outer space. It's actually come back. This is a space capsule that they used for Skylab, which was out in outer space, late 70s project. And as you can see, as we look at this space capsule, you can see it's brown and shaded. And if you look at the bottom part around the edges here, it's very black colored. The reason it's a black color is since this space capsule is actually one that's in space, it actually re-entered Earth's atmosphere. As this space capsule came down through Earth's atmosphere, 
the bottom of the case, space capsule gets real hot and heats up. And so actually these heat shields on the bottom here actually burn up and some of them even fall off as it comes down and returns. And this particular space capsule will actually land in the sea. And the three astronauts that are inside this will actually be, maybe will come and pick them up. So what we'll do here is we're going to walk around, but we're going to take a look inside the space capsule. And we'll take a look at where some of the pilots. There's three pilots in this space capsule that went up to Skylab that worked on that. And as you can see, this is the command module that the astronauts actually lived and worked in. As we walk up here and we take a look in here, this is actually a modern day space capsule. As we look in here, we can see there was three astronauts slept. One, two, three, right next to each other. The three astronauts lived and slept there for five days and five nights. They did all their work there, did their plans, did all their experiments, and actually slept and ate there. So this is the space ca capsule. And now what we're going to do is we'll walk over and continue on in the space part, and we're going to go over to the moon. And as you take a look now, what we're looking at now is a picture of the moon. And as you look at the moon exhibit here, there's a lot to see in this small exhibit. As we start over here on the astronaut, this is what a modern day astronaut would look like as he landed on the moon. As you can see the different blue and red temperature and air controls, because on the moon, it's very cold, and there's no air to breathe. So he has to have pure oxygen that he breathes, so he can breathe on the moon. As you take a look here, he has the American flag he's planting down. As you look down, and you see footprints along the moon. And what these footprints are, is actually there's no atmosphere on the moon. We're in outer space now. So when these same astronauts, 20 years ago, walked the face of the moon, these same footprints would still stay there because there's no wind to blow these footprints away. And as you look, there's a crater here. It's the same thing for a crater. Craters are different things that hit the moon and lay big divots in there. And since there's no atmosphere, they will stay there forever. As we walk across, we take a look at the lunar module and the buggy. This is something that the astronauts actually get to drive around and take a look at the moon. And as you look at the, look at the module, you can see it has different weather plates and tires around it. And that's actually weigh the module down so as the astronauts can drive around the moon and it won't float away. And as you can see, there's a picture of Earth over there because now we're actually standing on the moon and we're not on Earth. As you stand on the moon, it would actually be a lot less weight. You weigh about one sixth your weight. So if you weigh about 60 pounds on Earth here, when you're on the moon, you'd weigh only about 10 pounds. That's what enables people to jump around. When you take a look at pictures of the moon, you can see the astronauts jumping around on the moon. And that's why they can do that because there's not near as much gravity as we have on Earth here. And it's also very cold, it's the face of the planet, and it's also a gray tint. When you look up at the moon at night, the moon dirt's a kind of a gray tint. So that kind of gives you a look and appreciation of the moon and how it feels like to be on the moon. And what we're going to do now is we're going to wrap it up here from the upper deck as we looked at the different airplanes that we can fly in and the cockpit trainers, and also take a look at the moon and our space capsule. What I'd like to do now is welcome anyone to come on over to our National Aviation Museum here in Pensacola. Whether you're mobile and take the drive over or right here in Pensacola, Come on over, there's a lot of aircraft to see. We just showed you a few of the many exhibits that are here in the museum. So we invite all you guys, kids and adults, come on out, have a good time, spend a day over here at the museum. Thanks again for having us. Was that swell or what? We'd like to thank all the folks at the Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola, FLA. Don't forget to write us here at Camp Wallabear, P.O. Box 1548, Mobile, Alabama. Send us your knock-knock jokes, riddles, videos, whatever. And if we use it on the air, you'll get one of these Wastewell Camp Wallabear t-shirts. So until next time, see ya!